But today we're talking about messaging. If you're not interested in that, then you're in the wrong place. But uh, and about we'll talk some about my project to the New York Times Fabric. Um, that's me. Uh, I'm really happy to be uh, in the edge engineering group in a couple of ways. Uh, I've always liked working on the edge, exploring new technologies. That's been uh, my focus. Um, and the applications that we're developing live on the edge. So New York Times, we deliver the news globally. We gather news globally. Uh, we're not that big compared to many other tech companies. And so we can't afford a lot of people or a lot of infrastructure, yet we have to be close to the customer. And so we push our applications out on the edge, and that's um, where I've been focused for the last four years that I've been there. Uh, but let's, let's take a little, little bit of time travel. Um, this is actually the first computer that I worked on. It was a GE225. This is, we're back in 1964 now. And I've been working continuously in computing since then, so that's a lot of years, 50 plus. Uh, I used to have hair, but that's not me. Uh, so we'll talk about the fabric. Um, we'll talk about messaging in general. Uh, I may you know, cover stuff that everybody already knows. Um, We'll talk, talk about open source software, and we'll talk about use cases. In general, I'm going to talk about the things that I know about and the things that I use, and I'll talk about how we use that at the New York Times, and, uh, and then I'll talk about what we experiment with, because we experiment with a lot more things than we use, um, but we're always looking to the future and thinking about uh, which way um, technology's heading and feeling like we need to explore uh, those avenues. So the New York Times, when I came there, uh, somebody said during our intro, wow, we produce um, so much content. We produce the equivalent of a Harry Potter novel a week. And I thought, for a $3 billion company to balance on top of a Harry Potter novel a week, that's, we're going to have to get a lot of revenue uh, out of every word, everything that we do. and. Um, so I thought about messaging, because I'd worked with messaging systems, and they said, you know, publish, subscribe, New York Times, it seems to apply. Let's see what we can't do to very efficiently um, think about, architect uh, systems that will get the news out within a second, globally, reliably, on systems that would never go down, um, and on a shoestring at the same time. Um, so that's when I started to think about this concept, very vague, as you can see, called the fabric, a way of integrating um, our systems, kind of, I, th I think of it as sort of a, a greasy layer that will live on top of our other systems. Its sole job really is to uh, distribute messages globally and to gather information globally. And uh, so we conceived of the fabric as a, as a communications mesh. And uh, that this mesh would in turn be, be populated by instances that to some degree would be self-organizing. And uh, through the use, I'm not going to cover these things today, but through the use of Ansible and Console and other uh, products like that, uh, we have managed to make it self-organized and self-manage in a way that it only takes a few people uh, to keep us going reliably uh, globally. So how does this work then? Uh, connect into the fabric. And the fabric is actually distributed. It might be a little hard to see, but we're across multiple regions in uh, AWS. Uh, we are typically running in th three regions, so N plus one. Any, uh, actually, generally speaking, any region can carry the entire load. Um, we uh, 
It varies, our load varies by a factor of five to 50 to one during each day, depending on the news cycle. And so one aspect of the fabric is that the, the outward facing components need to auto scale. And so we do auto scale. Um, we auto scale with the messaging. I'll show you in more detail uh, kind of how that works. And of course, within each region, we break up into zones so that if a zone goes down or US East goes out, um, we, our load automatically shifts over to the surviving zones and regions. Um, in many ways, it's a global communication mesh, but with a memory. And we allow for our clients to not be there. And if they're not there, when they come back, we have a memory of what they missed. And we could deliver that to them. Um, so we go beyond just the normal messaging paradigm into storage as well. I'll cover that. Um, so anyway, messaging everywhere. Uh, let's do a little more time travel. I worked at Harvard for a long time doing uh, evaluating new technologies. Great job. You can never get a job like that. You want it. Lived in the ivory tower once a year. They said the canary has to sink. So we would have to go and tell what we had done. And our job was really to work with the, with the uh, divisions and offices at Harvard. Now, Harvard at that time had one of the biggest internet with a small i internets. 30,000 computers could actually connect one with the other, all running on different networks, all internetworked in the sense of the old internet. Uh, and we built systems that would run on this um, using messaging. Um, but if we time travel ahead, what are we looking at in 2020? And I haven't. Uh, uh, added up the uh, orders of magnitude here, but we're looking at 50 large number of devices, 50 billion devices that are within effectively the same addressability. Um, this is a massive increase. Uh, we look at that and we think, well, what, what does that have to do with us? But some portion of those devices are actually important to us at any one point in time. And so this is only 2020. We need to be thinking now about how we're going to extend. I mean, we don't know if people are going to want to have their news on the refrigerator when they walk in the door or what. But we tried to build the infrastructure to support that. And the only way to accomplish that uh, is through messaging applications. So let's talk about what messaging is. And, uh, uh, and why you should care about it. Um, just to kind of review for most of you, um, you know, message, think event, think metric. You know, message usually is a little considered a little bulkier, event somewhere in the middle. Metric might just carry a single number. Um, but they all have a header, which might include uh, routing, like timestamp, source, stuff like this. It's the metadata about the data. The body is the data that goes with the message. And so the object in a messaging system is to push those things around. And, but why should I care? What makes it important? And if you walk away with one uh, word that you associate with messaging, use this word, it's decoupling that messaging allows you to decouple uh, producers and consumers of messages. And uh, it's an old term, um, coupling, coherency, and so on. These are all terms from um, structured design back in the 70s. Um, but um, that doesn't mean they're no, not applicable uh, anymore. And so the goal here is to have systems that are loosely, loosely coupled, where the portions of that run independently. And I noticed uh, my uh, uh, acquaintance 
really a friend, but I've never met him. Gavin Roy is giving a talk on microservices next door. And I sort of wish I was over there listening to that talk instead of giving this one, but here I am. So, um, but it's all about um, loosening the bonds and making explicit the exchange of information. So, but how do you do that? And it's really through asynchronous interaction. And uh, so that's what we'll talk about. So, you know, it's like apple pie. Async is a good thing. And uh, if you think about it, most things are asynchronous. You wake up and you open your eyes. In effect, you've subscribed to visual information. Most of that information comes in asynchronously. Uh, you continue on your autonomous way. So does everybody else in this room. Most of the world, most of the events, most of the things that are going on uh, go on asynchronously. Synchronous happens when we proceduralize stuff, when we make dependencies between things. Um, but the world is really almost entirely asynchronous. That doesn't mean that we don't respond to events. In other words, when, uh, when I hear a gun go off, I fall on the floor. Now, I was in the Army and I was trained that way, but that still do it. Um, so uh, we respond. But async allows, here's a, I liked this particular one, allows clients, uh, you know, allows things to proceed um, uh, better. And this is my own <coughs> little diagram. Uh, it's Northern Hemisphere, obviously. It's rotating to that way. But uh, anyway. Um, a and B can continue and exchange messages. They're both continuing. And um, async, when you think in computing, um, it's a lot of scope. It can be um, at the instance level, and between instances, that is, processes, between processes, between functions. Some languages are particularly good at this um, and are designed with this, the functional languages. Um, Scala, Erlang come to mind. Um, it is a bit of a mindset change for many programmers to move uh, between these, in these messages, or sorry, in these uh, programming uh, languages. But uh, um, some, m much of the messaging work is done in, uh, for example, Erlang with RabbitMQ or, or Scala with uh, uh, Kafka uh, and other products. So I'd encourage you if you're thinking, when you think about uh, your systems, to always be doing little diagrams like this to understand where the idle time is, who's waiting on what, so on and so forth. And you can see in a synchronous example here, there's a lot of idle time as the producer and the consumer um, kind of wait on each other uh, to do things. Um, versus the async approach, where we've decreased the idle time. We're actually streaming messages from producer to consumer. The consumer previously has subscribed in this, that is, made himself available uh, for these messages. You know, latency is marked there. And you can imagine what would happen, just I don't have diagrams for this, but if those bars get farther apart so that the latency is longer, uh, kind of think about what happens in there. Here, and I'm showing it waiting only on just two messages and then being done, but of course you could get rid of that idle time on the right side of the producer by streaming more. And products like RabbitMQ allow you to control the number of things that are in flight at any one point in time. And we, in fact, use this to optimize our message flow around the globe where Japan is you know, 150 milliseconds away, Europe's 80 milliseconds away. And so we set up our asynchronous connections um, appropriately. OK, so let's get on to the open source software that's out there. And uh, I've worked a lot with RabbitMQ. This is their logo. And actually, in general, I'm using logos to represent it, uh, these products and not numbers. Um, I'm really fond of RabbitMQ. It's got a very, uh, 
It's got the capability to route things in very interesting ways. It's got a lot of flexibility, both internally and externally. Uh, we make use of all of that. Um, it means that RabbitMQ can cover kind of the full spectrum of messaging from um, within an instance where it's being used as a fast message bus to like we use it between instances and clusters that are thousands of miles apart and yet coordinating their actions. Um, it's good in a LAN. You can cluster RabbitMQ. In effect, this acts like a single instance of the Rabbit. Um, so it's a very powerful construct for, as you can imagine, setting up in an AWS region where you got three zones, you set up three rabbits, you cluster them. All of a sudden, that region, if a zone fails, it just keeps right on going because all the connections, everything automatically fail over. Uh, so I like it, and, and we set it up in both local area networks and wide area networks. So you can imagine that this is five regions or perhaps there are other devices. But you can set up very complex maps with RabbitMQ using its uh, substantial flexibility. Um, so I tend to think of RabbitMQ as being kind of a, a big circle. It covers all the bases. It does them very well, and it's very flexible. It's pretty fast. Uh, it's very complete. Um, so that's one of our major components. And now I'll talk about one that you don't ordinarily think of as a messaging system. But in fact, Cassandra is basically a messaging system with database semantics to it. Uh, okay. <coughs> So let me scratch in my head here. But Cassandra can set up both an Elan and a WAN with, uh, and, and, and by default, they all connect. And that's because it has gossiping protocols built in. This is something that will come in RabbitMQ, but it's not there yet. Uh, and it allows these, um, the clusters, this is really, in Cassandra terms, this would be a single cluster. The, the three together would be called a data center in Cassandra terms. And each of the eyeballs you see there would be running in what's called a rack. And the, each of those eyeballs, there could be multiple of them. So, you know, Apple runs tens of thousands of nodes, Netflix runs many thousands of nodes. If you actually look, they're running them in clusters, supporting microservices, um, database semantics. But we spread these, we spread them globally, OK? So, and they all stay in sync. We've, we've measured, Netflix measures all the time, uh, less than a second. So consistency available, you know, the CAP theorem, kind of give up on consistency, but what are you giving up with Cassandra? You're giving up one second. In the news business, this is okay. In the financial business, it might not be okay. Uh, but for us, Cassandra gives us this scalability, and we keep looking for ways to make use of the messaging semant semantics. How can we add messaging semantics? And there are a number of initiatives along this line, and between now and 2020, we're going to be really pushing the boundary uh, there and kind of bringing Cassandra in. Of course, we're using Cassandra as the memory that goes with our mesh. Okay, so if somebody comes in and they haven't seen them for a while, but they've got a message that says your credit card expired, we'll find that in Cassandra and deliver it to them as if that message had just been uh, sent. So let's take a look um, at how we actually set these things up. So I've implied this, but we have a rabbits everywhere policy. Um, in our regions, we have a central cluster of rabbits. And then uh, we've, of course, got Cassandra running there, too, also spread, all spread across zones. Um, but then we've got these gateway machines out there. Now, the top layer 
That's our fast scaling layer. Okay, so we can we can scale new machines in there. We predict our load, and uh, it takes us about two minutes to bring up a set of machines. Um, you know, in the morning we might look and say, you know, according to our history, you know, we have learning algorithms to look. We need to boost the load. Oops, there's an election, right? We might uh, really give it a goose, and we might. Um, scale these nodes. So we're always running at least three nodes in every region, need three gateway nodes. Um, we might run as many as 25 uh, in each region. And uh, the gateway nodes, um, the thing about them is um, they can go away. So our whole, scheme, our whole scheme here has no single point of failure, but of course that means we've got lots of individual points of failure. And so we build these gateways so that they can fail. And of course, we fail them when we don't want them anymore because we don't want to pay for them anymore. And when we fail them, then their, their sessions migrate to the other gateways. Um, how can you do that? And we do that because we don't maintain state in the gateways. The state, this is something Cassandra is really good for. We maintain state there. Um, really, the clusters of rabbits that you see in region A and region B are kind of matrix switches, I think. That's just kind of keeping everybody in sync. When some important news comes out, we send it everywhere. We replicate and duplicate stuff, and we create intentional race conditions to the endpoints. And we do that um, uh, because we don't want any intermittent failure to kind of to impede the, the flow. Um, okay, so let's look inside a gateway and how are we using uh, the rabbits there? And you can see I've sort of contorted that rabbit. I, it's too bad, but he's being a bus. Um, we'll take questions at the end if you don't mind. Okay, and. Uh, we organize our gateways with microservices. And uh, so we got some gateway code. It's looking up out at 30 to 80,000 uh, clients. And then we've got microservices that are doing things for it. Um, and then we've got the microservices that are specialized to push and pull to the Cassandra. And then we've got some rabbit microservices that do send and receive. So these are basically coordinating down to the core, okay? Um, this is what we run today and run in production. It works really well. Um, the problem is, what do we do about those 50,000 devices, uh, 50 billion devices that are coming in 2020? And so we've started to look at IoT uh, stuff, and this is a mosquito. I mean, you may not be familiar with Mosquito, MQTT, AWS came, just came out with a big announcement around MQTT. This is an old protocol, and there was a bunch, there are several open source products. We decided to experiment with Mosquito, and the reason we would do that is we have to build custom code in our gateway, and we have custom code running in our browsers and other devices. And uh, if we could go to a standard protocol, then Instead, we could use that protocol, and all of a sudden, everything from a pinhead device to a browser, um, there's already a library for it. IBM's very active in this area. AWS just got very active in it. It's, a, it's up and coming. Most people think about it as industrial automation or connecting devices. We think about, we just don't know exactly what we're going to want to be connected to in the future. And so we feel like we have to explore uh, IoT. Mosquito adds a broker. Again, we're talking experiments now. This is one of them. Um, it is an OK broker. It's really simple. Um, its big feature is that it's the IoT broker of choice. Um, and really, MQTT, there's HiveMQ also, and, uh, and several more. So that's. When we think about those 50 billion devices, that's what we th think about. Um, but it's written in C. So this is a problem for me because 
Um, if I wanted to fit it into my existing scenario, RabbitMQ uh, has, a, has a C interface, but I wasn't familiar with it. And it's not, it doesn't include an invent loop. And so it's a little difficult to do the asynchronous activity that I would want to do with it. Possible, but was more work than I wanted to engage in in an experiment. So I brought in another layer. 0MQ. And if you haven't played with 0MQ, I'd recommend it to you. Um, interfaces to everything, in our case, uh, Python and C, so I could use it as an intermediary. I had all my other microservices running there. I could replace my gateway code with Mosquito and, uh, and go to my endpoints. And everything else kind of stayed the same, a function of microservice architecture enabled by a bus running within your instance, OK? So we could experiment. Zero MQ, very fast. It's like uh, sockets. It's a TCP socket on steroids. You know, it's message oriented, but you can define your own protocol. It's not a broker. You can create brokers with it. It's like a toolkit. Uh, but because it's a toolkit, you can grab just what you need and make use of it. And it's a lot of fun. Um, well, how else could we do this? We started to look at NSQ. And I, as we're moving along, these are, I have less and less experience with these things, OK? So now, why would we use NSQ? And uh, there's a reason for that. And that is uh, everybody's excited about Go. And if they're excited, if my clients get excited about Go, I get excited about Go, right? They get excited about NSQ. I get excited about NSQ. So um, we'll look at using it. It's, it's interesting. It doesn't include all the capabilities that, uh, that RabbitMQ, for example, has. Um, but um, it's fast. So that recommends it. But more, it's kind of the excitement around Go that recommends it to me. Well. Remember, we talked about using Cassandra as a messaging platform. If I could use Cassandra as the messaging platform to connect things, then maybe I could do this. You notice I, going from this to, to this, maybe if we could have Cassandra be the link and really the only link between our regions, use it in a mess as a messaging system, then run something simple like NSQ or even 0MQ in the gateways, we could simplify our architecture. And if we want to go to lots and lots of devices, the way to make things go fast, in my experience, is throw away code. You know, get rid of stuff, get rid of layers. And um, so this is attractive um, when we think about it. As, as we look more to the future, you know, this still looks good. We need to do this. We need to spread wide. We need to go global. Um, but actually, we've got to turn that on its head. And my clients are wanting to do more in-depth analysis, more analytics, more learning over this big pipe of data that we can bring to them. Um, and that leads us to the last one I'm going to talk about, which is Kafka. And I have the least experience with this. And in fact, I don't like it very much. But I'm probably going to have to learn to love it, uh, again, because of my clients. And uh, Kafka is. Uh, really optimized for one thing, and that is for being a big funnel bringing data into an analytics stack. And uh, doing Lambda architecture, which you can read about elsewhere. But basically, the offsets there, I, I kind of think of Kafka as a database with messaging semantics. Not even a database, really. It's a sequential file with messaging semantics. And it's a group of sequential files and clients maintain offsets in there, and they can go to those offsets. 
And so my, um, I used to use SQL a lot. In fact, I was, uh, I grew up with SQL. And like most SQL programmers, I was anally retentive, I think. Uh, but now I've learned to love uh, Cassandra, where five nines of reliability is enough. And I don't care that much about um, the things that fall off, fall on the crack. You know, we're dealing with the internet. Things are not consistent. Um, but the people who want to do the analytics, they're more from the SQL background. And they don't want to lose a single thing. And they love this idea of being able to go back to the offset and then replay exactly what they just played before. Uh, whereas I would rather move on. But uh, anyway, we're going to end up with this sort of structure. And um, so we're going to have to deal with this. Somehow we're going to have to grab everything in the whole world and bring it down through this analytics stack. And so that's kind of what I'm grasping with, groping with now. Um, so use cases. I think if I were, if I just wanted to, if I wanted to have a full toolkit, I would use RabbitMQ. Stuff is easy to use. It's open source, easy to set up. There are drivers for everything. Um, and you can experiment across the full spectrum of messaging capabilities using RabbitMQ. If I just wanted to fool around and, uh, and kind of understand it and have a basic toolkit and, and yet something that was really quick and do something in lieu of, uh, say, doing a TCP socket connection, I'd look at 0MQ. It's much, much better than a socket connection. It gives you buffering, lots of stuff um, that's kind of hard to do. Um, and it's very, very fast, which makes it rewarding. But um, if I had, if I wanted to attract new developers into a project, and I wanted to create a messaging project that would get them excited, I'd orient it around Go, and I would use NSQ. And uh, it's also very fast. And uh, well, fast. Not quite as fast as your own cube, because it's doing more for you. Um, but fun to work with, uh, good tools, interesting tools. Doesn't have the clustering federation kind of capabilities that RabbitMQ does. You use redundancy instead. Um, if I'm really going to get interested in IoT and I want to move in that direction, then you need to be looking at the MQTT brokers or playing with the MQTT services. IBM offers free services. AWS offers free services. The first million uh, interactions are free, I think. Um, so there are a bunch of ways to play with IoT now and to use MQTT. And just, just a wealth of clients out there. If you want to program on a Raspberry Pi or you want to program on any little microcontroller, uh, you can do it. It's a lot of fun. Um, if you have to do analytics, then you need to be looking at, at Kafka right now. So there we are. I'm, uh, this is what I'm going to be working on over the next year or two or forever. Who knows? Um, I'm kind of hoping that I can do this with it. And that is, I want to be able to spread our analytics out, thin them out, and use them in multi-region. And the reason I might want to do that is that we want to get closer to our customers. That means we have to analyze things right away and be able to come back to them while they're there. Um, that means that my, my vertical guy might be doing the deep machine learning, for example. Whereas my horizontal pink thing up there would be doing OLAP, right? In other words, it's applying the machine learning model to the information that's coming right in and then using it to, for example, do ad placement or recommendations uh, in, in near real time out to uh, connected clients. Um, so those are the th kinds of things I do. Uh, we do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, um, one of my colleagues uh, works at scale with Cassandra and Titan. Uh, we structure all, a lot of our knowledge uh, about the New York Times and what's going on and so on in Titan. 
And this has proved to be a really useful uh, project. Um, anyway, that's me. I hope to include OLAP and Spark Streaming in my, uh, in, uh, my next phase of existence. Um, I've been there a long time. I've done a lot of other stuff. I worked at the United Nations for years, um, setting standards and doing other things like that. But this is actually what I love to do. And so I was very glad that gave me a warm corner to, to live in and uh, um, think up and play with stuff like this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>